It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. Since its establishment in 2006, the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship's always been about more than the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies or the Mormon Studies Review. As our mission statement suggests, we perform scholarly study of religious traditions and texts. Ultimately, the goal is to promote mutual respect and goodwill among people of all faiths, in addition to simply doing good scholarship for its own sake. We also seek to deepen understanding and nurture discipleship among Latter-day Saints. That's why our work encompasses texts and traditions from the Latter-day Saint tradition, but also beyond the Latter-day Saint tradition. Think about the Institute's Middle Eastern Texts Initiative, or our work on Syriac Christian texts or the Dead Sea Scrolls. In all of this, we're working to place LDS scripture alongside great religious texts of a variety of traditions. By looking at other religious texts, which are worthwhile in their own right, we come to understand other faiths better, as well as our own. In this episode, we focus on a text that Mormonism shares with Christianity and Judaism. It's the Book of Job. Dr. Mark Larimore joins me to discuss his biography on the Book of Job and the Lives of Great Religious Books series from Princeton University Press. Job is one of the most fascinating texts in the LDS Scripture Canon, so I hope you enjoy this episode enough to rate the podcast in iTunes and share it with your friends. Questions about this and other episodes can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. Dr. Mark Larimore joins us today to talk about his biography of the Book of Job. Uh, he joins us today from Shanghai. He's actually a visiting scholar at Fudan University right now in Religious Studies, uh, and he's also an Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Eugene Lang College. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Larimore. Uh, my pleasure. And I guess I could call you Mark, is that? Please do. All right, great. I, I thought we'd begin here uh, with an overview of the Book of Job. So this this book that you've written is in Princeton's Lives of Great Religious Books series. It's a really uh, great series that looks at religious books and, and sort of the life of those books uh, through the people who read them. So I think it'd be nice just to give people a, a refresher uh, about to the book of Job. So, and you do this at the beginning of your book, kind of a reader's digest version. So, go ahead and give mm -hmm. us sort of the general plot points, the characters uh, in this in this book. Okay, um, I imagine most of your listeners know the story well. Um, it tells the story of a man named Job, the greatest man of the East, um, who was extremely wise, extremely virtuous, and extremely prosperous. Um, and at the beginning of the story, uh, Satan, or the Satan, uh, an advocate, comes to the divine court and tells God. Um, I think that this man is virtuous only because you treat him so well. If you take everything away from him, you will find that, in fact, his piety is just a sham. Um, and so a series of uh, deprivations follow. Job loses all of his crops. He loses all of his children. Um, he loses his health. Ultimately, his wife leaves him, it seems, um, and he is left with almost nothing. Um, three friends show up, sit with him for seven days. Eventually, they have an extended uh, debate, which becomes quite... Uh, agitated um, about whether Job could possibly be suffering innocently as he believes that he does. Eventually a fourth character, somebody named Elihu, shows up. We don't really know who he is. He announces himself, um, speaks over everybody else very beautifully, very eloquently, and then disappears again. Um, makes way for the main star, God, who then appears in two speeches um, from a whirlwind, as we hear, at the end of which Job uh, puts his hand over his mouth, says, I have spoken of things whereof I cannot understand. Um, and then all the things, everything in Job's life is restored, beginning with the friendships. Um, it always pains me to have to sort of summarize the story in any form, um, because in my readings of the book of Job, I found that other people, uh, that everybody highlights on highlights a particular section that uh, speaks most to what they take to be the central core theme of it, but there's, a, there's the outline. I think so what's interesting, and we'll talk about this a, a little bit further along, is this the fact that any time you try to do a brief synopsis like this, you can choose different plot points to emphasize. You could make any of those elements the central core of the story and sort of read the rest of the book through that core, and it could come out with a, a lot of different interpretations from the book for that reason. And I assume you found that as you've looked at uh, different interpretations throughout the years during your research. 
Absolutely. In fact, if you ask people to do sort of the elevator version of the Book of Job, you'd get very, very different stories at different times in history. And as you spoke to people from different religious backgrounds. Yeah, that's what makes this book so fruitful. So that's sort of the general story. You, you cover it in the book in three really short pages. And then what's interesting to me was the first actual verses that you quote uh, from the Book of Job in your book are from chapter 19. And this is where Job is crying out that he wants his story to be known. And the quote there uh, from the book of Job, he says, Oh, that my words were written down. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and with lead they were engraved on a rock forever. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, why why grab hold of this particular excerpt at the outset of your biography of Job? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, that passage really um, has become sort of emblematic for the project, my project, as I was trying to make sense of it. Um, because what I found as I looked at the history of interpretations of the book of Job um, was that everybody, regardless where they came from, found they had to add something to the story and maybe leave some things out in order to make it into a coherent thing. Um, and Job's long encounter with his friends all has to do with his voice. Um, his, his, they're, they're not hearing him. He speaks. He's, of course, not entirely sure what he's saying. He's in great pain. He's in great distress. The world has fallen apart. But still, he expects people to hear him. He thinks his friends at least will remember who he is, what kind of person he is. And over the course of the dialogues with the friends, that, that turns out not to be the case. Um, and then at the end, not quite at the end, but as, as, the, as the conversation starts to become more and more difficult, Job speaks these words and says, OK, I wish that there were a way in which my voice could be preserved because I, even my best friends can't be trusted um, to hear, to understand, to listen to, to honor what it is that I'm saying. Um, and so when I, as I was going through the book of Job over and over again, in the context of this project, these words came to me to sort of represent what it is that the book of Job demands of readers. Um, because it says, look, my friends don't understand me. Do you understand me? Hmm. If only you could hear my words. And of course, we as readers are hearing his words in a book. So there's a way in which the book that sits in our hands as we're reading it is the answer to his hope in this passage. So that's why I put it there. Yeah. I like that. It, it does frame a biography of the book of Job quite well because it, it places him sort of <clears throat> at, at the center uh, in a way that highlights that he – He's sort of not the center of the book. He He's kind of begging to be. Everyone else is coming in and telling Job, oh, here's your story, Job. Here's your story, Job. Right. And Job's right. like, no, no, that's not right. Even even to God, he's you know sort of saying, no, what, you know, God, I'm bringing this to you and saying, you know, what's happening to me is wrong. And, you know, so uh, it's really cool uh, way to begin the book is to highlight that that tension, that central tension of the text. Uh, let's start, talk about what uh, biblical scholars say about the origins, the origins and nature uh, of this text and where it originated and, and maybe like how it wound up in the Hebrew canon to begin with. Because from what I understand, uh, Job isn't really, he's not an Israelite figure. He's, a, he's some sort of, mis he's from some place. We don't know where he's from, right? That's right. Um, so I'm not a biblical scholar by training. I've learned a great deal from biblical scholars in the, in the uh, context of this work. Um, but my sense is that the biblical scholars, um, despite their best efforts, don't know where the book is from. Um, they have guesses. Um, they've done an enormous amount of work on the text, which, whose language is very rich. Um, it contains more words that appear nowhere else in scripture besides there. So there are many puzzles. Uh, many philological challenges, and people have devoted entire careers to trying to trace particular passages to particular sources. We don't really know where it came from, but as you mentioned, um, what's very important about it is that it isn't about somebody who's part of the story of Israel. It's not about somebody who was a descendant of um, Abraham, mm -hmm. or even um, some later interpreters say he must have been in some way a contemporary or in some distant relationship of Abraham. But the way he's introduced, um, he comes from nowhere, and he stays nowhere. He, it's, he, he's in a different place. Um, and so the genre of the story already places it in a different place in a different time. Um, and this makes it um, in what, what 19th century scholars started calling an example of wisdom literature. So there is a, a larger body of literature to be found in a number of ancient languages. Um, about individuals intellectually pondering the meaning of their existence um, in the face of rather abstract questions about the nature of human life and destiny and suffering. Um, and the book of Job, um, like Kohelet, um, like Ecclesiastes, seems to be this kind of a text. And that then comes to your next question, which is wherever it came from, how did it end up in the Hebrew scriptures? And that's, a, again, a question which scholars have very interesting and uh, different views about. 
Um, my own favorite view that I mentioned in the book is that, um, in fact, the book of Job, uh, the poetry of it, um, was written by somebody as a kind of angry parody of these superficial, simplistic stories of faith that people had been telling in which, oh, well, you know, people who have faith, it really doesn't matter what happens to them. If God takes everything away from them, they'll continue to to bless him. And then in the end, everything will work out. For them. And this is the poetry that you so find sort of in the, the middle of the text, right? Sort of in the middle. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and in fact, you know, the, te the text is 42 chapters long. Um, and the first two chapters are in prose. And the last half of the last chapter is prose. So everything else is in poetry. Yes. It, it would sort of be like reading like a setup story in regular, like once upon a time, there was a guy named Job. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. it shifts to like we would, you know, conventions today, we would expect maybe a poem to rhyme or something. It would be that distinct, right, to a, to a reader back then where they would say, okay, this is prose and this is poetry. Yes. And mm -hmm. the poetry is sort of telling a different story a little bit than the frame, right? You've got Job, you've got these philosophical arguments going on, and the, and the frame story just sort of sets it up, right? That's right. It sets it up. Um, it introduces all the characters except for Elihu. Um, but even the way in which Job speaks, and he speaks a little bit in the prologue, um, is quite different from the way in which he speaks in the poems, uh, and what some people call the poem of Job, or the the dialogues, or uh, the the long the long speeches that are given. Um, even the name of God is different in these two sections. So um, this theory that Bruce Zuckerman had is that somebody wrote the poem, some brilliant, inspired genius wrote this poem um, because he was sick, or she was sick of of, of the the superficiality of a lot of stories about piety, um, because in fact, piety is much more dramatic. Faith is much more difficult. Um, patience is much more paradoxical than these stories suggest. And so Bruce's idea is that somebody came up with this brilliant poem, and it was so good um, that the authorities couldn't control it, that even if they said, this is a dangerous text, this is raising questions we'd rather you don't ask, we don't think it's good for you to ask them, um, that this text somehow took on a life of its own and ultimately became so powerful that the best thing that the canonizers could do was to appropriate it. Well, yeah, when you're, you're talking about piety there, it, it, that sort of pertains to the idea that if you're righteous, you will be blessed by God. If you're wicked, then you'll be cursed by God. Is that sort of the simplistic sort of story that the central Job poem is resisting? Yes, that, that's the kind of relationship that, that should obtain between human beings and their God. Um, one could see this as a sort of a cynical story um, in which um, religion is this silly thing and then smart people come along and make fun of it. Um, but there are other ways of reading it as well, in which you could say that, in fact, the depth of true religious experience is one that seems not to be captured very well by these simple stories. Mm -hmm. So the person who wrote this angry poem um, may have been inspired very, by very deep religious feeling not just by a sense of um, indignation at uh, pat religious explanations. Right. So it kind of gives us a general idea of, of, uh, of Job. We don't really know who exactly who wrote it. We don't know exactly exactly why it wound up in the Hebrew canon. We do know that it seems to be uh, more of a mythical or poetic story that's uh, addressing uh, questions of God's relationship to humans and, and the, uh, the relationship of, of righteousness and blessing and wickedness and cursing. So this is kind of a general view of it. And, and you mentioned that you're not a biblical scholar, you're a religious studies uh, scholar. So before uh, moving on to the next section, maybe we can take a second to hear about how you came to be the one to do this particular book in the series, your academic background. Okay. Um, yeah. So I come out of academic religious studies and in particular out of sort of modern reflections on what religion is. Uh, religion is something that seems to appear in lots of different cultures and lots of different times and still seems to have some common features across traditions. So the academic study tries, there are many different ways of framing it, but one way is to, to try and make sense of what this thing is, if it is in fact a universal of human experience, uh, where it comes from, what the aspects in particular religious traditions are that have a universal as opposed to a more particular uh, flavor, and then um, relate that also to the uh, exclusive and inclusive uh, truth claims made by different religious traditions. So in that context, I became very interested in the problem of theodicy, the problem of evil, trying to respond to what seems to be the evil and injustice and arbitrariness of human existence as something that seems to be a universal of human experience, which it seems that one could see religions around the world as trying to answer, trying to explain why it is um, that bad things happen to good people in the simplest form. So the uh, great German sociologist Max Weber um, actually built a whole large part of his theory of the sociology of religion around precisely this question. 
saying that the development of religious ideas across religious traditions in different places and times um, was, was pushed, was forced by encounters specifically with this problem, the problem of evil. Um, and in every discussion of the problem of evil, the book of Job um, becomes front and center, becomes the most important text in many, many discussions and reflections on this. And so my own work um, in a more general way on the problem of evil, uh, by way of Max Weber um, and modern theorists of religion, found over and over again that the book of Job seemed to be really the touchstone for especially Western ways of trying to engage with the mystery of evil. Um, and so then when I had the opportunity to um, teach a course about this, um, on the history of the interpretations of Job, I did so. Um, as I was putting together the course, I asked various friends, word got around, people thought the syllabus was kind of interesting, I suppose, and eventually um, I was called by Princeton University Press and asked if um, I might consider uh, contributing to their series on the book of Job. And how right. long did it take you to put the book together? Uh, about, about three years. It's about a three-year project. What's it like doing a biography of a book that way? Uh, well, in a way, it's what I had been doing before. Um, the earlier work on the problem of evil that I had done was a kind of historical way of trying to frame the question, to, uh, to look at different thinkers and people involved in ritual and storytelling and so on as responding to a long history of ways of trying to make sense of, of evil and suffering and God. Um, so I had been doing a kind of biography stuff before. Um, but the series, Lives of Great Religious Books, already has built into it this idea that books have biographies and that it's a, it's a different project from just trying to understand what the book itself means. Um, that the way in which people ordinarily or often approach a religious text is to just bypass the history of other readers and try to go straight to the text itself. And there's nothing that matter with doing that, um, except that over the generations, as people have done just that, um, each time they've done something somewhat different. So the story, the biography of a text like the, the book of Job is really the story, not of other people doing biographies, but of other people trying um, to get back to the source, to try to understand it. And as we see that their views differ in very interesting ways um, and coming from different places, they discover different, engaging, important things about the text. It starts to seem almost like the book of Job grows. Um, so however it emerged, whoever wrote it, however it ended up in the canon, that's not the end of the story of the book of Job, but only the first chapter. And after that, different people read it, tried to understand it, maybe added things to it, um, emphasized things differently, um, and people's understanding of the book deepened and broadened. Um, and so the biography of the book of Job tries to tell that, that kind of a story. I think it's such a useful metaphor, the, the entire series that uses this idea of a biography of a book, basically for the reasons that you just outlined, the idea that these texts uh, are added upon, uh, added upon as, as they grow and change according to different cultures and expectations and different readers and communities. And there's still a certain fidelity to the text because the text is still the object that people are focusing on. But you can right. see what what bothers people or what people like or, or what concerns people or what values they have. Uh, you can kind of dig that out of, uh, of the type of interpretation they do. I want to zoom in on something you mentioned as well, and that's that we modern readers, uh, we, we tend to approach – books with certain assumptions that, that complicate the way that we can understand the text. You describe some of these in your first chapter. And, and in fact, a recent reviewer of your book, I, I think, misunderstood this excerpt. So I wanted to take a moment uh, to have you explain your perspective on, on the general default assumptions of modern readers that they bring to the book that make interpreting Job uh, difficult for a modern reader. Okay. Um I think uh, what you're referring to there is my rather blithe assumption that as moderns, we think that, that all books are the same, that we know what a book is, that a book is something that somebody wrote at a particular time for, to, for a particular reason, and that we as readers have the job or the task or the privilege of going back to that moment, to that text which somebody wrote at a particular time. So in order to understand what the text means, we just need to go back, find the author if we can, interview them if we can, if they're long dead, then we have to imagine an interview, maybe we do other sort of stuff. Um, but that basically, that's the form that the things like biblical books take, that they're books, um, that some author uh, wrote it, and that its meaning is connected to the author's intention. And um, as this reviewer pointed out, biblical scholars don't think that and have never thought that, and that's true. And in fact, many biblical scholars would say that, say that the question of a human author is already secondary at best mm -hmm. when talking about a scriptural text. 
Um, but my sense from the way in which I've seen people talking about the book of Job today is that people do talk about it as though it's a book. Partly mm -hmm. it's got the problem that it's called the book of Job. Um, <laughs> so, of course, it's a book. They say, OK, well, it's the Job's book. Let's see what let's see what's in Job's book. Um, and the assumption is that somebody wrote it or maybe two people. Um, maybe one person, I mean, in the, the scenario that I mentioned, that somebody might have written this incendiary, brilliant, inspired poem as a way of responding to a stock narrative, would suggest that, okay, maybe two people wrote it. Maybe somebody wrote the original frame story, and then somebody else inserted this other thing into it. Um, but in any case, uh, what I suggest, what I was trying to get at there is that um, the effort somehow or other to find the author, if we can just find the author, then we'll know what the text is about, um, is a very modern way of understanding the book and also a very modern way of understanding the meaning of a text like Job, thinking that, you know, what it is that we're trying, that we're trying to get through the book into the, into the mind of the author. Whereas the history of the interpretation of the book of Job, the first most important fact about it is that the book of Job is part of a larger book. Um, and it's a different larger book if you're a Jew or a Christian, right. um, but in fact, it's only a chapter. Um, it stands uh, not on its own, um, but in a complicated relationship with a whole bunch of other texts that, for people who believe the Bible to be inspired, are the work of the same author, yes. So you might say, in order to you know, understand what the author of Job thought, maybe you'd better read Genesis and some other things as yep. well that that author wrote. And that changes um, how you're going to read the text <laughs> as well, right? You're reading a different Absolutely. book in a way, based on right. what you assume yeah. it's embedded in. Mm -hmm. So it's more like more like Balzac, where you know lots of different characters keep showing up in different novels, and you don't really understand what's happening in one particular novel, um, but you could find out what's happening, what this character was really about by reading the other chapter where right. that person came up. Or even if the characters aren't the same, you know that this particular writer writes a certain kind of book, so you'll get a better sense of the kind of thing that the writer might be up to by looking at the writer's other work. And for a book as difficult as the book of Job, it's natural then to try and find out more beyond the texts. So the really big difference, I guess, between modern ways of reading the book of Job and older ones is that modern people think that the book of Job has to stand, should stand on its own. It's sort of a closed work, a closed universe of meaning. Um, and then you do lots of philological work, you try and clarify it, you try and get rid of things that shouldn't be there, you try and figure out what the original form of the text was, and then, and then you understand it. Um, whereas the older view would be to say, well, of course the book of Job doesn't, can't, shouldn't interpret itself. Um, but there are other things that can be used in order to understand it. And the first of these then would be other, other texts that are in its general environment, which would be other biblical texts. And then later on, there would be uh, authoritative interpretations of various kinds. The whole history of the interpretation, whether it is by rabbis or by uh, the church fathers or, or so, or that sort of thing. Now, a moment ago, Mark, you also sort of pointed out uh, a question that people have when they come to this text. Um, you're raising these difficulties that we see when different interpretations happen over time. A pressing question is that, you know, we're sophisticated, scientific, awesome, modern people, right? We sort of like to be on the cutting edge, and most people aren't going to pick up an astronomy book from 1830 and, and, and dig through it, you know, let alone uh, an astronomy book from the 7th century or something. So, what about interpretations that of Job that, that occurred before biblical scholars understood the composite nature of the text better and, and maybe uh, wanted to situate it using modern tools? Why don't we just junk those older interpretations? Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. you know, oh, they're operating under limited understanding. Like, what good are they? Excellent question. Yeah, so so one of, one of the, the difficult challenges for me putting together the book was there are a bunch of things that scholars now pretty much agree about the text in particular, that it wasn't written all at once by one person, that it does have, even within the text itself, different layers, and we haven't, there's no universal consensus on what they are, um, but it's pretty clear that it seems to be composed of many different pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and that changes the way in which you read it, because then each of these pieces seems to require some kind of explanation on its own. So that's the way in which many a biblical studies course um, about the book of Job would begin. But my concern as I was putting together the book, this book, my book, um, was that, well, none of the people I was going to write about for the first 80 percent of the book knew this. They weren't reading a book that was a composite. They were right. reading a book that fit together and they weren't stupid. They didn't they didn't not notice um, disjunctions and things that we would now say, oh, well, that was a that was a scribal error or that was an insertion or that was a mistranslation or things like that. It's not that they didn't notice those things. They noticed them even more than we did because they thought that every word of this inspired text was important. And right. the more paradoxical it was, the more likely it was to contain very important 
truth. Um, so in the end, I decided to put the uh, biblical scholarship in my final chapter, um, which is where it happens in the history of the book, that the book actually throughout most of its long history um, came through as one thing, full of, rizzle, uh, full of riddles and paradoxes and other sorts of things. But, um, and the reason why I thought that it would be safer to put it at the end is that um, if I'd mentioned this stuff at the beginning, it would have been very difficult for many readers, I think, to take seriously, um, say, medieval Jewish readings mm -hmm. in which Elihu is centrally important. And Elihu, just about every biblical scholar now agrees, was an insertion to the text. Mm -hmm. Even the way I start, when I told the story at the beginning, when I said Elihu sort of shows that we don't know he's coming and he introduces yeah. himself and then he disappears. Um, this is sort of circumstantial evidence that people think quite conclusive, that Elihu uh, wasn't part of the original poem. That there right. was a stage when, you know, the story was just Job and his three friends and God. And then at some later stage, somebody else put in Elihu. So again, that person might have been inspired, but still, it's clear that Elihu was added later. Right. Um, so what would the rabbis think about that? That's a silly question. But for them, there was no question that however it ended up there, Elihu was really, really important. Um, and for some of them, actually, it turned out to be quite important that he seems to come out of the blue. That suggests that he might be closer to God than some of, Job, than some of Job's friends are. Mm. Um, so you can do some interesting things with the text when you when you sort of bracket these other maybe academic assumptions. And you look at some of these older readings and you're going to get different. You're going to notice different things in the text, yes, I think. Yes, right. Yeah. You, you, mm -hmm. One of the phrases that you use, you ask people to pluralize their sense of ways of reading. So in other mm -hmm. words, you want people to learn that there, there are different, many different ways to approach even the same text. And, and, the, and that, the fact is that interpretation itself, even if it's, you're not, you don't even realize you're interpreting it, every reading is an interpretation, and every interpretation involves choice. There's this great excerpt. Uh, on page 210, uh, you have the book there. I'd like you to read that. It's uh, on page 210 the, where you talk about this issue there. Okay, yes. All right. <clears throat> in one way, the findings of historical critical scholarship have forever changed the ways in which the Bible is read and lived. Whether we absorb its suggestions or confine, ourse confine ourselves to a received text for theological, traditional, or literary reasons, we are making a decision. These decisions are not made lightly and are so shaped by communities of worship and interpretation that they may not feel like choices. But in a pluralistic age, choice is inescapable, even if it is the choice to accept the tradition you were born into. Yeah, I, I think that's that's really great. And I, I really applaud the, the decision to put the academic and scholarly discussion near the end of the book so that people can focus on those earlier readings without having the modern scholarly ideas in their head to sort of obscure them or or evaluate them that way. So those interpretations, I hope readers realize that they have value in and of themselves beyond uh, what modern scholarship uh, talks about. And modern scholarship brings excellent, you know, perspectives to bear as well. But going back in time and seeing those other interpretations, I think is really valuable. And that's sort of what I want to talk about next is ancient interpreters. So... Right. Well, actually, the, um, and, and thank you for what you just said. That's really the, the main thing I hope to do with the book, which is um, many, many contemporary readers would say, well, given what we now know about the book of Job, any kind of reading that doesn't build in the fact that Elihu was, a, was an add-on and so on can't possibly tell us anything interesting about the text. But in fact, my sense is, well, taste and see. If you actually right. sort of look at some of these earlier interpretations, not only will you find that they are entirely aware of the complexities of the text. But they discover things that you might not discover otherwise. That they approach the text with a, a dedication um, that discloses things about the text that we might not otherwise know. And my sense is that this text is so important and so complicated and so useful for such important questions that we need all the help we can get. So why, why write off all of pre, pre 20th century interpretation? That's Dr. Mark Laramore. He's the Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Eugene Lang College. He's joining us today from Shanghai, uh, where he's a visiting scholar at Fudan University. So let's go on then to some of the ancient interpretations. You mentioned that the Book of Job shows up in the collection of sacred books for two different religious traditions. Uh, it began in the uh, Jewish canon, the Hebrew Bible, and then uh, was adopted by the Christian community. So what are some of the differences between 
uh, Christian and Jewish interpretations of the book of Job early on? Uh, well, that's an enormous question. Um, yeah, you, before I answer that, let by me, the way, let me, you, you, yeah. it's huge and you cover it uh, in, a, in a relatively short chapter. And even even then, I'm kind of surprised at how much you were able to distill. I mean, these are the size of these biographies of these books is so small compared to the just sheer volume of stuff you could have talked about. Well, uh, thank goodness for the, the brevity of the book. It would be impossible to write a book longer than that. I think if, you know, the editor had said, take as long as you need. Um, you'd never, never do it. Yeah. Again, right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, this, this is, um, especially because the more time I spend with these interpreters, the more awe I actually feel at, again, yeah. at their commitment and just how hard they work at how far they go at how patient they are. And, uh, somehow or other, uh, I managed to be impatient and not go so far because I had this little window to, to write in. Right. Um, so, so I was going to say really quickly, um, before talking about the difference between the Jewish, ancient Jewish and Christian interpreters, one important thing I think to mention is that they're both doing a similar kind of thing, which I've sort of been hinting at before, which is that they treat the Bible in a different way than, than we now do. Um, and they treat it, and there I use the, the work of a very important scholar named James Kugel, um, the idea that um, ancient interpreters, the people who put together the Bible during the Babylonian exile, um, approached it with four assumptions, which he calls that the idea that the Bible was a cryptic text, that its meaning doesn't reside on the surface, but you actually have to dig, you have to scratch, you have to turn it around to try and get beyond it. Mm -hmm. um, the sense that the Bible speaks to us today, it's not merely a work of history. Um, the sense that the Bible has no mistakes, so that everything that's in there is in there for a reason, so that if a line is repeated, that's not an error and it's not a redundancy. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a reason for every single part of it. Um, there's an answer to the question. You might not be able to find it, but you can and should ask about every single detail. Everything is there um, for a reason. And then finally, the idea that the book is um, entirely divinely given, um, in which God speaks. And this is something that Jewish interpreters um, had, and then the early Christians picked up the same thing. And so in order to try and understand the text, um, they looked at every single detail. Um, they assumed it was speaking to them. Um, so the times that they were in, um, the context they were in, the religious situation they were in was one that they thought was a relevant consideration for understanding what the book of Job might be saying. Um, but they also, um, in order to understand it, looked at the other parts of this perfect divine revelation. So the other parts of the Bible. So that if you were a Jewish interpreter, you naturally looked to other sources um, in the Hebrew canon. Um, and if you were a Christian interpreter, you would also look at a whole bunch of Christian sources. And it's easy to see these as very different things because they obviously look in different places and find different things. Um, but the first point I'd want to make is that they're doing the same kind of thing. And it's something that's that's worth, worth learning from. Um, major difference between the two of them that follows from that, of course, is that um, for Christians, um, everything that happens in what Christians call the Old Testament is prologue. And ultimately, the meaning of everything that happens in the Old Testament is disclosed finally only in the event of Jesus Christ. And so the Old Testament can't interpret itself. It can raise questions. It can tell you things. It can give you the template for understanding the way in which God relates to history and to human nature. Um, but it can't tell you the final story. The keystone of the arch has not yet been put in, right? Mm. Um, and so Christian interpreters um, would look, read the book of Job inevitably, as every, every other text would read it differently from the way in which uh, Jews did. And here, and we've mentioned this before, the fact that, that Job seems not to have been an Israelite um, becomes a huge bone of contention, it seems, between early Christian interpreters and their contemporary Jewish interpreters, where uh, a number of these early Christian interpreters said, aha, so here's this man, Job, who was the most virtuous person of his time, and he was not a member of the people of Israel. So you didn't have to be a Jew in order to be uh, mm -hmm. favored by God. And you didn't have to be a Jew in order to be a perfect human being, mm -hmm. or as close to a virtuous, perfect human being as could be imagined. Um, and that was a great consolation and inspiration to Gentile converts to right. Christianity. Um, so they saw in Job... Um, hope sort of demonstration within the within their testament that you didn't have to be a Jew in order to be a Christian. By the same token, um, it does seem that a number of Jewish interpreters at this time started backpedaling quickly away from Job's historical character at this point um, and said, no, 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 no. The story of Job um, isn't about a real person at all. It's just a parable. It's just a story that people told about something. Um, and it does seem that the, the sort of the inter the Jew 
Jewish Christian context can help explain why it is that some of these early Jewish interpreters moved away from thinking about Job as an actual historical figure uh, in order in some way to maintain the sense that the Jewish community was the place to, to be. Let's talk about Maimonides for a second. You have a section in there. Uh, he's a Jew, major Jewish figure from the Middle Ages, and the Maxwell Institute's actually done a number of really great um, academic translations of his, some of his medical works, and we've just uh, made a deal to do a new edition of Guide to the Perplexed, which is... Uh, really? Uh, yeah. Fantastic. So they're going to do... Um, yeah, they're taking the text from... I believe, was it the University of Chicago that did the... The main yes. one most people use, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we're, we're bar, um, using that text and doing an updated edition of that uh, through the Maxwell Institute. So we're really excited about it. And I was happy to see uh, you raise it here in this book. So Maimonides uh, is, a, is a major Jewish figure who also engages Job and does that a little bit in Guide to the Perplexed, too. Is that right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, in fact, so the only thing more hubristic than taking on the Book of Job would be for me to try and take on the Guide for the Perplexed as well. <laughs> but I will say, standing on the shoulders of giants who have worked on, on Maimonides' great, great work, that it does seem that the discussion of the Book of Job is a kind of microcosm of one larger part of the argument of the Guide to the Perplexed. And the Guide to the Perplexed is trying to understand how it is to relate the scriptures um, with philosophy. Right. And... The book of Job seems very much to be pertinent to this question because it seems uh, to be a lot of talk, a lot of people giving a lot of arguments. And since these arguments aren't coming out of the Jewish tradition, they seem like general philosophical arguments. Right. So Maimonides, um, building on earlier Jewish interpretations like Sadia Gaon's and others, um, sees Job's conversation with his friends as a philosophical disputation. And argues, in fact, that the three views that the friends Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar represent aren't just random, made up, you know, hypocritical views the way many modern interpreters take, who don't take Job's friends seriously at all. They just think that they're party, party, party line people. Right. Uh, but Maimonides, like other interpreters in the, in the past, said, well, you know, the Bible wouldn't give us three voices if they were all saying the same thing. In fact, since we've mentioned Elihu is important, Elihu turns out to be the key to, to this for, mm. for Maimonides. Um, the Bible wouldn't give us four views if they were all the same view. So what we need to do is understand how each of these views is different. And it takes a certain amount of effort to make them clear and coherent and different. Um, but he then associates them with all the ancient views of uh, providence that existed um, before Revelation in order to try and understand it. And... Um, my my reading of the, the way in which the book of Job functions within the guide of the perplexed is it's sort of a moment where all these things come together. Um, God speaks and God doesn't answer the questions. So you've had these human beings who are trading the best philosophies they can come up with to try and understand what the relationship of divine providence and human merit or human understanding and philosophy are. Um, they're at loggerheads. They can't come up with one view or another. Every view has major problems of one kind or another. Uh, then Elihu comes along and says, God speaks occasionally. People don't usually pay attention, but you know, he does say enough. Um, and by the way, he sometimes tests people, which interestingly was not a view that any of the earlier views had. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly God comes in and says, can I show you my zoological garden? And <laughs> yeah. um, they weren't talking about animals. They weren't talking about, you know, the, no. the, the, the morning star and the, and the hail and all the other sorts of things that God talks about at all. Um, so Maimonides has this brilliant reading, again, building on a history of, of, of medieval Jewish interpretations, in which the only and best thing that God could say in response to human questions about providence is to talk about divine providence um, in a way that doesn't immediately connect. So that you might say, God missed the point, or God's avoiding the question. Again, there are contemporary secular and agnostic yeah. readings of the book of Job that say that's what happens, that God uh, doesn't have an answer to the question, so he blusters, or he bullies, or he says, uh, uh, let, let, me, let me show you the rhinoceros. Or yeah, like <laughs> yeah, have you seen um, this thing? And Maimonides says, as, again, building on Sadia and others, that um, what God is doing there is showing a kind of a providence that is like, but not like any human understanding of providence. So it's in some strange way recognizable as a providence, but it's not clear what its relevance to human experience could be. Right. And that for him then provides a way of uh, arriving at an, under, an apophatic understanding of divine providence in which we can say, we know that God's providence is real and we know that it's not like any human conception of providence. Right. And this is something that could only be told in this paradoxical, inside-out, dramatic, strange sort of way. Um, and the book of Job does it 
um, through the way in which it's structured, by bringing in these friends who trot out all the best philosophical views, do the best um, to their uh, ability, including Joe, to try and make sense of human experience in the best human terms. And then God comes along and provides something that is indisputably providential and yet also indisputably not applicable in any human, straightforward human way to human experience. Um, and that gives you um, this almost touching the, the divine, which, which, which is what Maimonides is trying to get at. Yeah, so he's like one of the one of the central Jewish figures who sort of tackled the text. There's there's a really unusual, um, well, I guess it's not unusual to to most readers, I guess. But in the New Testament, there's this reference to the patience of Job, and and you know that oh, yes. that yeah, that's sort of puzzling because if correct me if I'm wrong, but the book of Job never describes Job as patient, and in fact, if if you read closely, well, you don't have to read that closely. You just read what Job is saying, and he's angry. He's not being he's not being patient. He's not being very patient at all, right? Uh, yes, in fact, he's many many things. Um, David Kleins, who's a who's a wonderful evangelical Bible interpreter who works who's written an amazing a commentary on the book of Job. Um, sort of tallies up the different speeches that Job gives and says that each of them is actually in a different mode. Uh, but none of these modes, and, and they are protest and confusion and grief and distress and yeah. anger and righteousness, and, but none of them is patience. Yeah. So, but still you have James saying, well, you have heard of the patience of Job. Yeah. What? What? Where, where, where <laughs> no, did we hear about I haven't, yeah. <laughs> we heard about it from you. Yeah, from you. We about it from the book of Job, right? Um, so that actually, again, is an interesting um, test case for sort of the difference between Jewish and Christian readings. So since Christians naturally and appropriately use the New Testament as the key to understand the Old Testament, since James is part of the New Testament, um, here you have somebody, an, author, an authorized later view, telling you, by the way, Job is a, is a model of patience. So then you go back and you look at the book of Job and you might say, this doesn't look like patience to me. Um, but if you're an ancient interpreter, then everything must make sense. There must be a way of making all these things fit together. So instead of saying, ha, I think James got it wrong, or I think James is talking about some other Job, yeah. which is what contemporary scholars now say, instead you'd say, ah, okay, James must know something about Job that I haven't seen. Let me read the text again um, and see if I can find some patience in it. And there's a way in which you can read Job as um, an exemplar of a kind of fidelity. It's not a patient, it's not a submissive patience, obviously. Right. Um, but it is um, an abiding in the hope of a relationship with God or an abiding in confidence that somehow or other um, justice will be done. So there may be a way, there, there are ways, um, many ancient interpreters came up with them, um, in which Job turns out actually to be an example of patience. And then after you've done that, suddenly the meaning of patience has changed. Yeah, you can so what does patience mean? Patience means suffering, but it also means sort of abiding, persisting. He's persistent. Um, he's persistent, Yeah. Um, so we, patient, as moderns, think yeah. that persistence and patience seem like very different sorts of things, but maybe they're not that different. Yeah. And maybe one of the things that the Bible is telling us then is that, you know, a, a purely passive patience um, isn't the only kind and may not be a sufficient kind. That's there may good. be times when patience takes the form of persistence. Right. See, I think that, again, speaks to the value of some of these ancient interpretations where it can make you revisit the idea of patience and how uh, how reading that text can bring out a different element of patience than you might have on the top of your head in your culture and in your background, I think. And um, right, I mean, and then and then in the book, then you go back to the book of Job, and then you notice a few things. And one of them is that it's not just at the beginning Job never sinned with his lips, but at the very end, mm -hmm. after the big exchange, is after God speaks, he then turns to Eliphaz and the other friends and says, "You have not spoken of me what is right, the way my servant Job has." Right so after have, Job's complaint. Yes, yeah. after all this time. Um, and also the whole thing is set up as a wager between God and Satan, right? Yeah. In which, so if, if God, if, 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 if Job actually did curse God, then Satan would win. Yeah, he'd win. So obviously, you know, Satan didn't win. Satan disappears. I mean, if Satan had won, um, that book, whatever its merits would not have found its way into the canon of scripture. So since Satan lost, then in some way we, we must know that whatever it is that Job says can't be counter evidence to his, his piety, he must, must be in some way a, a, a proof of it. And that so point that, of yeah. Satan's also sort of a, a, a difference between some Christian and Jewish, at least early on. I, I think Jews, I, I don't, I'm not fully up to speed on their view of Satan, but wasn't the Satan character, what it be, what Satan character became in Christianity is this, you know, this person, Satan, uh, mm -hmm. the Lucifer or whatever you want to call him. And in this Job text, it's, it's, like more of a label, like Ha Satan. It's not. It's not like right. a proper name, right? 
Mm-hmm. It's 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 a job. It's a job description. He's like the, the it's like the, the the public prosecutor in the divine court. Yeah, so he he comes there, and that, that's the whole frame story is very interesting to look at um, outside of the Christian lens of a personified Satan character, uh, and and it doesn't mean that there is no such being. What I'm saying is that uh, you've got in according to an older Jewish reading, you've just got this figure, sort of like a lawyer showing up, and and it's right. so it's not exactly. a guy in a red suit and the pitchfork. It's uh, you know, more of a lawyer figure, and and that can mm-hmm. change your whole reading of that exchange that God has. In, right. uh, in the frame story, right, and 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 he and he's not he, he need not be a malevolent force at all. Right. He can yeah, be he's sort just of a, saying, sort of like look, a quality inspector. Yeah, sort of like yeah, quality he's like, control yeah. within the creation. Where like yeah. you know, God is saying, ah, oh, look at this wonderful creation yeah. I've made. Look at Job. You know, they don't get it. They don't get better than that. And the yeah. quality inspector says, really, I think that yeah. if you hit this with a hammer this way, it'll sound hollow. Yes. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. An- another figure that I uh, wanted you to touch on, we've talked a bit about Maimonides, uh, a Christian figure is John Calvin, and, and you identify uh, yes. him as a major figure in Job interpretation. Absolutely. So go ahead and talk about what happened to Calvin's Job uh, during the Reformation. Okay, so Calvin was somebody who, going back to the very first passage from Job that, that I quote that you mentioned, the one about, oh, Job saying, I wish that my words yeah. were written down in a book. Calvin thinks that's terrible. <laughs> he wishes that it hadn't happened. Or, I mean, it's a good thing that it happened. It's good that scripture happened. But he right. thinks that, in fact, Job has uh, Job is really pushing the limits. Um, so Yeah, he's Job uncomfortable him, with Job, right? Like he's Calvin, deeply uncomfortable yeah. with Job. Because, I mean, and in a sense also, it's because he's listening very carefully to what Job says. By the time um, Calvin and the Reformation is happening, they're reading the book in a different way than earlier Christians. So instead of saying, well, Job is really a figure for Christ, and in fact, he's a prophet who knows that his Redeemer lives and so on, um, Calvin reads it in a more historical sort of way, looking just at the plain plain meaning of the words. And the plain meaning of the words is there was this guy um, uh, who was pretty good and thought he was even better than that. And then God pushed him a little bit, and then he starts whinging, and then he starts complaining and starts calling people names and doing all sorts of other things. And he's really not an example for us at all no um so so calvin um actually thought that job was a pretty bad example um and his response in a nutshell is don't be like job be like david right so not only is like you know like david so you're actually part of the covenantal tradition but david was a sinner and knew it and repented job must have been a sinner if you're Calvin, there are you know, exactly. all human beings are reprobates, right? So I mean, right. You, may, you may be you may be the best of a bad lot. So so maybe Job was the best of a bad lot, but a sinner he was unquestionably, right. and van and, and does nothing compared to God. And somehow, whether he thinks that he can and should have a relationship of equals yeah. with God, very bad stuff. And that does import Calvin's theology, right? Because if you just read the Book of Job, if you just stick to the book, it is saying. Job was a perfect man. He was. The whole point mm-hmm. of the story is to say, here's a perfect person who then was cursed. So what do you do with that? And Calvin's saying, wait, a human can't be perfect. So he's putting mm-hmm. his theology into the text when the text itself is saying, no, Job was perfect. That's the point. And I think mm-hmm. modern readers would kind of miss that because I think a lot of modern readers agree, in a sense, with Calvin that, that no one's perfect. Nobody's perfect. Well, the point of the book of Job was this guy was Mm-hmm. He's, he's, he was, I mean, God himself. I mean, this is the God who in Genesis looks at his creation and says, this is good. Right. Yeah. So this God looks at and he says, look, there's there's no one like him. So again, he's not saying he's perfect, um, but he is saying he's, you know, he's pretty much as good as human he's beings. As good get, as and that's get. pretty good. Yeah. He's yeah. really, he's really good. He's and not he, saying, and he know, didn't you know. sin against God. The point was like, no, he hadn't done anything to merit the bad things that were happening. And his friends were starting right. to suggest that he was like, oh, Job, you know, what did you do, man? Like, if this bad stuff's happening, you did something. So just out with it and let's be done with it. And Job's saying, yeah. no, I didn't do anything. And I'll stand as witness before God and and I'll have my advocate. The translation right, says right. Redeemer. He says he's going to have his advocate stand and testify on his be- behalf that he's innocent and all this. And <laughs> it's like So, so, so what's, what's really interesting, as, as Calvin reads Job's encounter with the friends, is that everything the friends say is good Christian theology right. as far as— Calvin said. And what Job is saying is stuff that's pretty heretical, but still you have to deal with the fact that at the end, God says, well, you know, the, you all spoke the, wrong. Uh, these guys haven't spoken rightly about me yeah. the way Job has. So how do you, how do, you deal with that? Um, and then he has a very Calvin camped out in sovereignty, right? That was sort of where he went, because God's final speech is basically like, I, look at my creation. It's amazing. So, mm-hmm. you know, do you really want to question me kind of? 
And I think yeah, and 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 also um, so similar to the the argument that we were talking about in Maimonides that that God's presentation of the wonders of nature is a kind of an argument. It's yeah. an argument about um, an order and a beauty and a rationality that are um, incontestable, and yet. Yeah. The, the, their their immediate relationship to the human can't be spelled out by us, yeah. um, and so Calvin has the same sense. So that I mean, what 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 God doesn't shout at Job. God God shows Job um, an extraordinary beauty, um, just how how perfect the rest of creation is. Um, and of course, as he's going on, then Job realizes how small he is, and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and so, just one last point on, on like Job's innocence. So Job yeah. never actually says that he's innocent in the text. That's one of the things that we all think mm. he does. Mm. Um, instead, he's complaining, as you said, about like, well, whatever I've done, I couldn't possibly deserve what has yeah. just happened. Yeah, it's not equal. So he's, so he's not saying I'm spotless, I'm, I'm unblemished. Yeah. He's saying, well, no. Um, but still, um, this unprecedented series of misfortunes and, and tragedies and torment that, that, that have happened to me that seem to single me out in front of everybody as particularly in need of chastisement, why is that happening to me? I'm not worse than other people. I'm, I'm mm. probably better than most people. Um, so that better than most people bit was already the pride that got Calvin. That, maybe that's it's why, like, yeah. Right? And well, maybe that's why Job's friends started getting angry too. Job, <laughs> Job's like, "Hey, I'm better than you guys," you know. Mm -hmm. Well, he was. <laughs> <laughs> According to the frame store, he definitely was. But yeah, he was. But then again, if you're a Calvinist, then you'd have to say, "Well, yeah, yeah. maybe he was, but that had nothing right. to do with his merit." Right? Because so he's he fallen. He, yep, that, he's got that, right? uh, this. The original sin, you know, Calvin. Everybody's fallen, and everybody's refuse in the eyes of God. So yeah, his theology drove that interpretation uh, of John Calvin's, and, and it became pretty a pretty influential uh, interpretation down through the years. Then, right? I mean, yes. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, we're talking with Mark Larimore. He's the author of a wonderful biography on the book of Job. We'll take a break for a moment and be right back with more of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Sam Brown was a teenaged atheist struggling to get firmer footing. On an August Sunday morning in 1990, he found himself sitting at the sacrament table in an LDS chapel next to his brother and two close friends preparing to utter a prayer over the water. What brought him back? How did he go on to write a sympathetic, scholarly book on Joseph Smith and early Mormon theology? And how did his research shape his faith? Find out in the Maxwell Institute's new book, First Principles and Ordinances, The Fourth Article of Faith in Light of the Temple. Following on the heels of Adam Miller's Letters to a Young Mormon, Sam Brown's book is the latest in the Institute's Living Faith series, books aimed at spiritual and intellectual inspiration. You can find First Principles and Ordinances by Samuel M. Brown at maxwellinstitute.byu.edu or on amazon.com. We're back with Dr. Mark Larimore. He's the author of a biography on the book of Job. And uh, Mark, a lot of scholarly approaches to religious texts focus on the interpreters of major figures, like we've just been talking about Maimonides and Calvin. But you also spend time in your book... Uh, looking at Job as he was known to what you call many ordinary people. And I thought it would be interesting for you to take a little bit of time here to talk about how ordinary folks through the years came to experience Job in different ways that aren't these major figures like Maimonides or Calvin. Yes. Well, ordinary people, that's that, that's us, right? Yeah, it's and us, yeah. It's uh, hard to know what ordinary people thought. Um Hard to know if people who didn't write things down or didn't right. have the time to or didn't think it was worthwhile writing things down were thinking. Um, but historians in recent generations have worked very hard at trying to sort of recreate the, the lived worlds of ordinary members of religious and other sorts of communities. And they pay attention to things like the rituals and festivals and things that people participate in. Um, also practices of um, within, say, Catholic Europe relics. Turns out that Job was a saint. Um, or there was a Saint Job who was venerated by all kinds of medieval people. There's still a church in Belgium. Um, I had the great pleasure of getting in touch with their archivist as I was putting together this book um, called the Church of Saint Job in, hmm. I'm not going to be able to pronounce the name. Um, <laughs> um, and yes, they have this beautiful figure of Job. And it seems that for, for a thousand years, Job has been the central figure in their church. And they had litanies and people came in and they prayed to St. Job for intercession in various ways. Um, and this was in some way very much continuous with the way in which Job was understood in the Catholic Middle Ages, where Job, if he was a prophet, 
um, was somebody who had a special um, understanding of the divine, and if he was a figure of Christ, surely had a special relationship with Christ. Um, and therefore, that would make him a very useful and powerful intercessor if you needed help with something. And so Job becomes a figure um, of prayer, somebody to whom you turn. Um, and there were amulets. Um, Job, um, since you had, you know, saints who were there as the kind of, you know, spiritual medicine for all kinds of things. Um, Job was somebody you turned to for a whole bunch of different kinds of things. Um, so Job was a really important part of people's lives in that way. Um, and also, um, as people started to um, perform, so let me take a step back. Um, Job's voice was a very important part of the liturgy of the dead um, within Christian traditions. Mm. Um, and what's really interesting, what really blew me away when I first learned about it, um, was that the speeches of Job that are in this practice, in this in this liturgy that was done initially in monasteries, um, are those in which Job is at his most anguished. Mm. Those which to some modern readers he seems most impatient and most, you know, impious. Yeah. Um, in fact, those in, wishes, in which he wishes he were dead and wonders why he was even born and nothing makes sense to him at all. And, and God has become totally mysterious and opaque to him. But these words turned out to be a very important part of the way in which death, the terror of death, the terror of judgment, the mystery of those things were experienced within monastic communities. And then um, through books of hours, um, which were little books that lay people took in order to um, do kinds of prayer on their own in their, in their houses, um, these words of Job became parts of the, the daily practice of many women, especially. Um, and one thing that's very, the, the, the really moved me deeply as I was looking through this, was trying to imagine what it would be like to be somebody in the 15th century or the 16th century. Um, I don't know what's happening in your life or something, but as part of your religious practice, you spend some time every morning and every evening with this prayer book, yeah. going through various prayers. And among the speeches that you intone are these speeches in which Job wishes that he'd never been born. Yeah. What, what, what could that possibly be? What could that do? And, one, and, and what, it came to me that what that did was just the way in which, you know, if Job is patient, then the book of Job teaches us what patience looks like. Um, if Job is in, the, in, this, in this text as a, as a sort of an authorized voice, then as I give voice to his words, as I perform them in my own life, um, um, he, shapes my, he shapes me. He gives me, he gives words, he, gives, he articulates things in my own experience that I might otherwise not know how, might be afraid to, might be unwilling even to express. Mm -hmm. So um, my, my, my rather bold suggestion in that, subject, in, in that se section was that it was when these words of Job sort of moved out of the communal liturgical context of the monasteries into private individual experience of people working with their books of hours, um, that that's really the beginning of, say, a kind of a modern individual subjectivity, and that Job is my voice. Yeah. So in my life, everything's falling apart. I don't know what's happening. Um, who do I turn to? In the past, I might have turned to St. Job, said, St. Job, help me. But now I become Job. Job's words become mine. Job teaches me how to be patient and even, or how to be persistent. And even how to be toward God, right? I think a lot of, exactly, a lot exactly. of the scripture before Job is sort of God and his prophets— uh, facing the people, and in Job you have you have a person, Job, turning around and facing back to God, and so that sort of gave people a way to face back to God and speak to God, mm -hmm. rather than being spoken to. Right? I mean, God does come and speak to him in the text, but it's after all of these anguished. Uh, that's right. That's right. And then and then so as you're reading this again, this is hypothetical, but. As a speculative, yeah. um, but as one of these people is reading these texts, you kind of know what the story was of Job. Yeah, you know that in fact Job was suffering terrible torments, and there was a reason which he may never understand. But that at the end, things work out. One of the most fascinating things about Job um, that the book has provided grist for the argumentative mill of believers, mm -hmm. as well as doubters and skeptics, and that part of it circulates around this idea of the problem of suffering and the problem of evil. So there was this rise of critical interpretations of Job, some of them atheistic, some of them skeptic. And I'm thinking, for example, of Voltaire uh, versus Alexander Pope. And you, you write about the way that they use Job to different ends. Can you kind of give the gist of that story, sort of the different ways that these figures use Job? Uh, well, um, that would take a long time, but I'll Try and be really quick. I think most yeah. people know the story of Candide, um, which is a famous 18th century novel by Voltaire about this rather simple, guileless person um, who goes through life and all sorts of terrible, terrible, terrible things happen to him. 
And he, he has a teacher who's with him all the time named Pangloss. We call Pangloss. He glosses over everything, right? Yeah, everything um, And Pangloss yeah. always says, ah, oh, everything is for the best in this best of all possible worlds. And at the yeah. end, you know, and, and palpably, that's not true. Every, I mean, they go through earthquakes. They go through pogrom. It's just one, one, one misery after another. Yeah. Kind of a, a cavalcade of horrors. It's a kind of... Uh, disaster porn, to use a contemporary yeah. word, actually. Yeah. Um, but at the end, somehow, the, you know, Job, you know, Voltaire says, no, uh, I'm sorry, Candide says, you know, I'm just not interested in these questions anymore. We just must cultivate our garden. Don't even ask. Don't even ask these questions at all. Because, in fact, human experience is meaningless in, in, the, in the context of the larger thing. And um, he, uh, Voltaire, in correspondence with somebody, I think it was Frederick the Great of Prussia or something like that, said that, in fact, the book of uh, Candide is the story of Job brought up to date. Mm. So this is my way of packaging what I think the book of Job is telling us that's very important, which is don't ask. Yeah. If you did find out, you wouldn't like what you heard. <laughs> because, right. in fact, human beings don't matter. And that's a way of reading the, uh, the theophany, the divine speeches, is basically saying ostriches are important. You know, yeah. uh, crocodiles are interesting. Human beings, no. Nah. So yeah, right, I'm not going right. to talk about that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so you have Voltaire doing that. And one of the people he's responding to is Alexander Pope, um, who wrote a beautiful essay called The Essay on Man, uh, which is a sort of a, an expanded version of the theophany, but in a different way, in which there it's focusing on the fact that God speaks to Job. God speaks to human beings and explains things in human language. So he explains things that are paradoxical and sublime, things that blow our mind, things that don't make sense to us. Um, but it's very interesting that this view, which basically said that, you know, um, all order, what is it like, uh, all suffering is but order that you cannot see or something. That right. this, this idea that um, there's meaning to it all, like no matter there's what. meaning to yeah. all these things. And in fact, this is such a great meaning that, you know, as the parts don't make sense. But when you start to see the whole, then you'll realize how much better it is that the, uh, the, the dark parts, because the whole thing adds up to this large, spectacular thing, like what people sometimes say if you're, you know, if the creation is a mosaic, right. if you're just focused on two or three little dark tiles or something, or, or tiles that are all the same color, you might say, oh, this is, has no pattern at all. But if you step back, then suddenly you see this magnificent thing. Um, but what's really interesting about the Pope Voltaire encounter, where Voltaire, Pope is providing a kind of a philosophical articulation of a Christian Stoic view, um, and you have Voltaire providing a sort of an almost atheistic, Epicurean, modern, skeptical view. Yeah. Both of them are working with the with the template of the Book of Job in order to make their point. Now, those are two figures from from quite a while ago. Um, I think biblical criticism of scholars, say in the nineteenth and, and early twentieth century, certainly impacted how Job would come to be read. But there's one particular historical event that that you say probably impacted interpretation of the text more than than any scholar could how did the the holocaust impact the book of job and the way that it's been understood the the, the Shoah, the holocaust yes um there i'm was was profoundly inspired by the work of elie wiesel um, who had been wrestling with the book of job since the time when he was a child um, and um, was deported to auschwitz um, he was lecturing about the Book of Job immediately after World War, uh, the end of World War II in 1947 and displaced persons camps in France um, and continued to write about Job in many, many different forms. And he has a quite wonderful series of claims about Job, one of which is um, even if Job didn't exist, he certainly suffered, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which is to say that the story of Job is, is, is unbelievable. We don't think that that sort of thing could possibly happen to anybody. And yet every part of that story we know is true. Yeah. Which sort of gets beyond the historical question in some way. He says, like, even if Job didn't exist, his suffering did. Yeah. So we use the story of Job. Um, so let's not get caught up on who this one particular person was and where this person lived and if this person lived at all. Um, that's actually a distraction from the fact that we don't that we we know that the kind of suffering that Job endured happens all around us all the time. It yeah. gives us a way of talking about that. Don't let the figure of Job distract us from that. Um, but the other really interesting thing he said was that um, Job became Jewish over time. So we mentioned that um, since Job was not a member of the people of Israel at the beginning, um, and that even that you had some early, well, not early, so Jewish interpreters at the time of early Christian interpretations starting to distance themselves from the reality of Job, and even from Job, right. because these Christians found him too useful for a Christian message about, oh, well, Jews are not that important a part of, of the story of salvation. Right. Uh, 
So um, Wiesel knows all this stuff and says, okay, well, so Job wasn't Jewish at the beginning, but over time he's become more Jewish. And that's because the figure, as it were, if you sort of think, is, it's like he's been filled in. Um, and, this, and the story of his life has been filled in by the uh, 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 extraordinary series of horrible, horrible deprivations and suffering and genocide, which the Jewish people have suffered uh, most decisively then in the Shoah. So that by the end of the Shoah, Job has become Jewish, that the Jewish people have lived every part of Job's story. Hmm. And so Job then becomes the face um, of the Jew after the Holocaust, in which everybody has turned on the Jew, the Jews who thought in Germany, for example, that they had found a place they could be at home. And in fact, their friends turn on them the way Job's friends turn on him. Nobody is there for him at all. Everything is taken away from him. He is stripped to nothing but a single voice crying in confusion and distress and anger. So Job becomes Jewish um, for the Jews, the, the, uh, whatever discomfort they may have felt with uh, Job as this strange figure before, no longer an issue. But in the same way, right. um, because of the, the Shoah, the Holocaust, um, which became sort of the archetype of a kind of uh, appalling, entirely disproportionate, entirely unbelievable mm -hmm. suffering visited on um, good people. Um, Job has become a sort of a representation of the Holocaust and Jewish people for many Christian interpreters now as well. So right, so it's even spilled Christian, over, yeah. right? Yeah, so, so for Jews as well as Christians, not all Jews, not all Christians, but for many, many more Jews and Christians, when they look at the story of Job now, um, they see not the story of some wise man in the East who lived in the time of the Bible, but wasn't really part of the story of uh, the people of Israel. No, they see uh, the Jew in history. Um, the one who has a special relationship with God, which somehow or other manifests itself in, an, a special, in a special history of suffering. As I'm reading your book, uh, and I, I did notice your emphasis on the, the question of theodicy, and that sort of stems from your background. And one of the things that I appreciated most about your biography of Job is, is that it, it struck me as I'm reading that in the past I've sort of considered myself, put myself in Job's shoes, um, because we all have trials and difficulties. And so, you know, I thought I, I would imagine myself as Job or sort of put myself in his shoes as someone who uh, was blessed by God, but then felt like I was, had been cursed by God and sort of trying to reckon with, you know, how that stacks up. But you, you invite people to consider themselves also as, as Job's comforters, perhaps even more than, than Job himself. And, and you, you invite readers to approach the text as friends of Job themselves. How did you come to that point of emphasis? And maybe you can flesh that out a little bit. Uh, that's a, that's a great awkward question. I'm not really sure why uh, I had time for the friends of Job when so few other people do. <laughs> when everybody yeah. else is looking at the story of Job, Job clearly a, a person who is suffering terrible things that he ought not to be suffering and his friends come along and this. Uh, so, so, so the modern readings going back at least to Kant is that these friends are not friends. No. That in fact what they do is they try and distance themselves from Job, that they try and play God. They try and say, mm -hmm. oh, well, you know, we're on God's side, not on your side. Yeah. Uh, that they're really looking out for themselves. That's, you know, not only is what they say, um, does, does it have no meaning, but in fact, they are not friends. But again, partly, I guess, because I'd been spending time with these ancient interpreters. It's kind of like, well, you know, but the conversation with the friends is more than half of the book. Yeah. If they were just false friends, you could have brought them in and out in, a, in, a, in you know, two or three lines. Yeah. The way Mrs. Job, you know, who's a whole other subject, uh, Mrs. Job gets brought in and out with a single line. In, yeah, she's in like, just curse God and die is kind of right? her. <laughs> then so, she's so, so why do the friends get so much more billing? Right. Um, and, and, and so my sense is that maybe what the book of Job is really teaching us is that not that, that you know, you should find good friends, not bad friends. <laughs> yeah, right. But that in these moments of the greatest suffering and confusion, um, even your friends will turn on you. But that also means that in moments of confusion, uncertainty, I may turn on my own friends. Yeah. That what the book of Job is telling me if I read it um, is that my best efforts to be faithful to my friends will probably fail in, in the face of the mystery of human suffering. Um, and that fills me with anguish um, and a 
commitment to be more faithful to in the witnessing of suffering of others. And you compare that then with other readings that say, okay, well, we know exactly what Job is feeling and his friends are wrong. Well, that's just what Elihu did, right? So Elihu yeah. came, come into the, came into the text and said, you know, Job, these other friends of yours, they're not listening to you. Let me tell you. Yeah, Let me tell you what so. happened to you. Yeah. So he doesn't listen to what Job's been saying either. So many, many readings, um, and, and these are good readings by good people, right? I, I'm, 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 I, don't, I don't mean to demonstrate what I'm talking about, saying that they all think <laughs> that they're better than Job. Um, but there's a real temptation to come in and say, you know, if Job had just said it this way, yeah. or if God had just made himself clearer and said this, that there are all these readings, interpretations of the book of Job, good, well-intentioned ones, in which people say, ah, Job, move aside. You're, 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 uh, let, let me say what it is you're trying to say. Yeah. Or, God, okay, give me a chance. Um, people are, aren't getting it. Let me let me put it in human language. Um, that the text in some way invites people to come in and play God or displace Job. And these are the two things that the book of Job really tells us we should not be doing. Yeah. That we can't actually understand what God is doing. And that Job needs, that Job's situation isn't one that his friends, even his best friends can understand. That the best thing that we have is his voice. Yeah. I and so what, 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 I encourage, what I invite readers to do is, well, as you look at the book of Job and imagine yourself in this situation, and many of us have been in Job-like situations, and we will be again, yeah. um, realize there are lots of other situations in which we are friends to other people who are in Job situations. And let's try and be better friends. Yeah, I think... We'll fail. Yeah, but, you're going to fail. The thing that, that I... I don't remember who made this observation, but it, it stuck with me ever since that some of the best work that his friends do in the book of Job, some of the best work they do is in that first seven days when they mm-hmm, sit, mm-hmm. just sit with him and they don't talk. They're just there Absolutely. sitting. Absolutely. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one part that people usually forget. In fact, I forgot to mention it in the little summary I started with that the first thing yeah. they do when they see Job. No, you fact, mentioned it. Thing, you did. Yeah. You said they were there yeah. for seven days and. Yeah, so the first thing that when, when, when the friends come, they don't even recognize him. Yeah. He's such a, he's such a, Sad uh, case. a ghost of his former self that they don't even recognize him. Yeah. And um, if, you, if you have a copy of the book, the picture on the front yeah, um, is from a Byzantine Bible illustration showing the friends at the moment of recognition, where oh, okay. for the first time they realize that this, that this poor wreck of a human being they see in front of them is their great friend Job to whom something has happened. Yeah. And so they tear their hair uh, they tear their hair, they tear their clothes, they go through all the, the gestures of mourning, and yeah. then they sit with him in seven days in silence. Yeah. And they don't speak until he speaks. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's better than most of us. Could yeah, do. right, right. And, and again, it is it really is some of the best work they do. I, I think the book of Job, it's still such a relevant book. There's so much that, that you can draw from, from the book of Job. And I think that's the value of your biography of the book of Job is to sort of get people to pluralize their readings, to be open to different interpretations of the book of Job, to chew on the book of Job, and to really dig into it and, and get different perspectives. And, and your biography certainly uh, will help readers do that. So uh, congratulations on that. And, and I appreciate you taking the time today to talk to us on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Uh, it's, been, it's been a great pleasure. Thanks a lot, Blair. That's Dr. Mark Larimore. He's the author of a biography of the Book of Job from Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Books series. You can pick that up on Amazon, and you can probably pick up the Book of Job on your own bookshelf tonight and start to read it again. I'm sure that you'll see things there that you never saw before. I'm Blair Hodges, and this is the Maxwell Institute Podcast. Mm-hmm.